right. Welcome back, everyone, to Diary of an Empath. So today's guest is really, really special. I wanted to do something a little bit different than the norm because this is something that sits a little bit closer to who I am as a person and my background and my ethnicity. And my next guest is Janen Matari. She is a two-time award-winning Palestinian storyteller, a TEDx speaker, and a renowned Palestinian advocate. I'm so, so excited to have her on the show today because this is something that is part of who I am. So welcome to the show. Thank you for coming and thank you for just being on this platform and being available to speak. Thank you for having me. What an introduction. Such an honor to hear that. You deserve it. You deserve it. All of the work <laughs> that you do. And um, I kind of stumbled on your page by accident. I don't know how I ended up following your page, but when I saw that you have a background of being Brazilian and Palestinian, I think you actually left a mm -hmm. comment on my page. And I think that's how we started following each other. And for those of you that are not aware of my background, that's part of my ethnicity. I'm Brazilian and Palestinian and, and it's quite a mix. So we don't usually see too many people that have that background. So it's like, I have to connect with this person. Um, so tell me about your upbringing and, and who you are and your, your background and a little bit about your story. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I, I guess my upbringing was fairly normal in the American sense of like being a teenager, going to college. Um, my parents really emphasized, um, and they tried really hard to make sure that we could fit in. And I think it comes from their experience of, you know, being um, first generation to move here, immigrants, and um, not really having the experiences of like a typical American teenager. So growing up, we were, you know, put in every single sport. We did all the play dates. We did everything that normal American kids were doing. Um, and then there was just they always made sure that we knew we were different, but in a good way. Um, like they told us that we were the normal American kids, but there were other aspects of our upbringing, like keeping the culture alive or the foods that we would eat or the holidays we would celebrate or just the way that our family dynamic operated compared to my American friends, that my parents always made sure we knew we were different from our American peers and that they stressed as it was a good thing. It was something to be proud of. It was you know, something that we wanted to honor. Um, and so I give them a lot of credit because now that I'm a mom, um, it's super tough to like figure out how you want to raise your children. Um, you know, before you have kids, you always talk about what you're going to do differently compared to your parents. Um, and, and now that I'm actually in it and I'm living through parenthood, um, there's a lot that I'm taking from them that I, that I really admired. And obviously I didn't admire it when I was a teenager and I had these rules, um, but, but seeing it today, um, you know, from the, the parental view, um, I give them a lot of credits. I think they did a really good job when it came to raising us within each culture. It's hard. I, you know, I, um, I, I can relate in a way and in a sense, I'm kind of distant too, because my mom is Palestinian and Brazilian. So I grew up with just my mother and she's half and half and she grew up with her Brazilian mother who passed away at a very young age. And then she went to go live with her father, who is from Palestine, very much more of a traditional Palestinian background in terms of the traditions that they uphold in Palestine versus more of American mm -hmm. culture. So my mom was kind of shifted into this culture shock because she was used to living with her mother. And so when she raised me, she kind of raised me to not really have any type of traditional values. I didn't really grow up in a religious household. I didn't know what Muslim was. I didn't know about any of these things until I got older and I reconnected with that side of the family. And although I'm not Muslim, it's something that still really intrigues me because it's part of who I am. It's part of my culture. But one thing that I noticed with my mom even, and even talking to a lot of my cousins who are second generation was that culture shift was really difficult from, you know, what their parents were raised and taught to do versus what they're kind of dealing with as still being Palestinian and Muslim and but also being more Americanized and dealing with these feminist movements. So how did your cultural differences impact you growing up? Um, that's an interesting question. So 
and I forget the name, but I forget the actual terminology of it in psychology. And I've talked about it enough that I should know what it is by now. But there's this notion that, um, or, or there's a theory, you know, that um, immigrant parents are stuck in the time zone of whatever period it was from when they immigrated into the U.S. or, you know, some other Western country. Um, and so my my parents immigrated here when they were very young. Um, so they just kind of took on and adapted whatever culture my grandparents came here with. And, you know, when they're immigrating here from the, in the sixties and the seventies, they were stuck in Palestine and Jordan and Brazil in that time period. And so they took those customs and what, you know, what the countries were like then, and they took it and tried to keep it alive here in the U S. And so, um, I guess I grew up with a, this, concept of what the Arab world was like in the 60s and the 70s and those rules and regulations on women um, kind of came with that. And so a lot of the things that my parents didn't really understand how to communicate with me, like um, it, it, it comes from, I think, that never having been a conversation with their parents. Um, and them, And that's how they believe that the Arab world still functioned and operated. And we know today that that's not true. It's, um, you know, some countries in the Middle East are super, super progressive. Um, you know, women are in positions of leadership, political power, um, and, you know, everything from clothing to education to career, like they have also grown and adapted and progressed through time. Um, and so getting everybody in my family to kind of see that and let go of, you know, that um, connection to the Arab world in the 60s and the 70s that they've been holding on so tightly to. Um, it was a little bit difficult, especially when it came to talking about super controversial topics. Um, you know, dating was still like a no-no <laughs> in my household. Um, and I think that also comes from me being the oldest child, the only girl, um, in addition to, you know, all of the Arab stereotypes. Oh, that definitely it. added on to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess I just got lucky in the pool of like sibling order. Um, and so it was, it was kind of difficult to navigate. And I think that those restrictions that came more from like a communal standpoint and less of what my parents actually wanted. It was like, this is what they thought was appropriate by community standards that, um, it, it made me kind of, for a couple of years, I really did, uh, pull myself away from being Arab, being Muslim it was not something that I advertised. If somebody asked what my faith was, I, you know, I would tell them, well, I grew up Muslim, but I'm not really sure I believe in anything right now. Um, and I had a really hard time just because when it comes to women in conservative communities, um, a lot of the restrictions that are put on us, people justify it by saying, well, this is what the religion says. Well, this is what the culture says. When it might not actually be true. You know, if you go and you read the Quran, it's, I like to believe that Islam is a very feminist religion. Um, but it's the patriarchy that has kind of seeped into it, into Islam tied to the Arab culture, uh, that has really just kind of blurred the lines of what is appropriate or, you know, what women are allowed to do. And so, um, I had a good chunk of my like young adult life where I was super confused. Um, I was really, I really only learned about my religion and, and my culture from what people were telling me from what I was learning in Arabic school and Islamic school. Um, and then it wasn't really until I started to take an interest of it on my own. And I started to research the Quran from like more of a um, critical thought perspective and just learning about my Palestinian heritage that I, I realized how much I was missing um, from each piece of my identity from, you know, being a Muslim woman and what Islam says about women to being a Palestinian woman and the role that women have played in the liberation of Palestine. Uh, and I was just totally fascinated and it just sucked me back in full force. So that's really interesting. And, you know, um, I, I really would like to ask you how the cultural differences impacted you in terms of fitting in, because I know for me, I didn't grow up in a Muslim household. I grew up with a parent, though, who did grow up in very two distinct households, two distinct religions, and felt like she did not fit in and felt and was likely told 
by many in her family that she didn't fit in because she wasn't fully Palestinian. And it's not to talk bad about anybody in that family, but I could imagine being a young woman and growing up in a different time period, growing from, I, I can empathize, I can have compassion and I can understand how there would be that level of not knowing where to fit. And now me as a 36 year old woman, learning about my heritage, learning about my my ethnicity and my background. I don't know where I fit in. I didn't grow up with my dad, but although I acknowledge his ethnicity, but I grew up with my mom. So when people are like, well, what are you? I, I, I'm Brazilian and Palestinian. But sadly, I don't know much about either side of my ethnicities, although that's a huge part of who I am. People look at me and they're like, well, I could tell you're something. You're something different. You have some type of ethnicity, but I don't know what you are. You know, so it's like when I meet, you know, now that I have a relationship with that side of the family, it is a little difficult because sometimes I feel like I don't fit in. I have to cover my tattoos. I don't have to, but I feel obligated to because I don't know what the right thing to do is. I'm like, okay, let me cover it. I don't know how my grandfather is going to react. I call him CD. I'm sure you do too. I don't know how he's going to react. I, I have to make sure that, you know, I do certain things, even though it's completely out of my comfort zone, but I do it out of respect, but I have no idea what to do and where to fit in. Have you ever felt like that? Like in terms of not knowing which side of your heritage to fit in? Are you, are you on the Latina side? Are you on the, the Palestinian side? Are you both? How, how did, how did you navigate that? That, I mean, that is like my entire existence, both in real life on social media. Uh, it's what I have made a career on is like how difficult it's been um, to find my place in the world and each community. Um, I, I will say like for as proud as I am to be Latina and to be Brazilian, I do feel like I'm lacking knowledge um, when it comes to that side of my family. And um, the only connection that I have to it really is my grandmother on my dad's side. Um, she is the stereotypical Latina grandmother, super superstitious. <laughs> like, um, and, but like the rest of my dad's family from the Latina side is all in South America. They're in Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay. Same. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't have, like, the majority of what I've been raised around has been my Arab family. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I, I'm always curious as to whether or not, like, if, if I had been raised around the Latina side more than the Arab side, if it would have had this identity crisis my whole life. And um, through, you know, connecting with people on social media and giving, you know, that TED, that TED Talk, I, it would have been the same. Like, from what I've heard and learned from other people's experiences, it would have it would have been no different. Um, so th there's just there's always that cultural struggle when you're trying to fit into some type of Western community um, coming from anywhere else in the world. And I think um, throwing the Muslim aspect into it all um, just added another complicated layer um, because I didn't know growing up I, I didn't know how to separate my Muslim identity from my Arab identity and vice versa. It was just a thing that, you know, it was always blended together. Um, and so I didn't know how to embrace being Arab without also having to figure out how to embrace being Muslim. Because, um, again, it was never something that was separated for me. And so I think now I have a semi-decent handle on, like, being able to separate the two and talk about them as two different identities. Um, which is something that I think is super important to do because, you know, uh, a Muslim from a Dezé community it does not have the same experience as a Muslim from an Arab community or, in, uh, you know, um, an East Asian community um, or even, you know, the, the Muslims in Europe and the white Muslims that we have here. Like our experiences are all different in terms of what our ethnic identity is. But when it comes to our religious identity, the struggles are all still kind of there. Um, so I think... I think all of this to say that for as much as I like to believe I had a normal childhood and upbringing, it was still very difficult to fit in. Um, and I didn't feel like I was white enough for my white friends. I didn't feel like I was Arab enough for, you know, the Arab friends that I had. Um, and so uh, it's, it's still, I think to this day, something that I'm overcompensating for. I'm trying to find, you know, I don't speak Arabic. So I've been taking classes for the last 16 years of my life with no, no end in sight. Um, but so I'm just trying to overcompensate for that lack of 
connection that I have to my Arab identity that is so huge in the community. Like being able to speak Arabic is such a huge part of being Arab. Um, and I don't have that. So I do all of the cooking, you know, the, the uh, traditional foods. I celebrate all of the holidays and make sure we go big so that, you know, everybody knows we're Arab. Um, you know, I, my son has like the most Arab name that you could possibly give a child. Um, and so I've really just tried to immerse myself in Arab culture, everything outside of, of learning the language. Um, and I think doing that has made me let go of this belief that I also need to pretend to be white and pretend to fit into American society. Um, especially in today's world and not to get political, but just given the landscape of everything that's going on in this country, um, I'm okay not fitting into that community anymore for a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And, um, I think that trying to fit into it made me betray who I am as an Arab and Muslim woman and being able to see that now and recognize it and, and understand that there, to, at least to me, and I'm sure people would argue differently, but I, I really believe that there's so much beautiful history and tradition tied to non-Western cultures that so often get erased um, or just kind of put on the back burner because we're trying so hard to fit into what the society is deemed as normal um, that I, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want my kids to have that experience where they're trying to, you know, fit into a group of friends that don't have the same moral values that don't, you know, their families don't operate the same way that, that we do. I really admire the fact that Arabs are huge on community and Latinas. You know, it's, it's everything where we operate as a unit. It's not an individual experience of life. Um, and I really love that. And I think that I'm okay, like, not trying to fit into the other side anymore. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that everything you said is super powerful. And, and I appreciate your vulnerability, because that's, that's something that's not easy to, you know, come out in the open with to say, hey, I still struggle with these things, because I know there's a lot of people listening, who maybe aren't <laughs> Middle Eastern, but maybe they're Hispanic, they're second generation Mexican or second generation Colombian or Puerto Rican, or maybe they're struggling with those same um, value systems or those same uh, second generation issues that maybe you say you struggled with as well. So I think mm -hmm. that's really amazing that you you shared that. And, and I can relate on some level because I just like I said, I've seen my mom go through what she went through. And then being who I am, just kind of navigating well, I, I don't really know much about my Arab culture. I don't speak the language. I, you, you're more than I do. You cook probably more than I do because I don't. <laughs> but for, for me, I, I wanted to give my daughter a Arab name. Her name's Amina. And that to me, oh, beautiful. thank you. Yeah, and that to me was, you know, just kind of acknowledging that part of my ethnicity to say, okay, I'm still proud to be, you know, even though I'm not 100% Palestinian, it's still part of who I am. It's still part of my history. And I'm proud of that. But when I heard you say that there was a time in your life where you really weren't out in the open with it, you really weren't connected to it. You're not the first person that I've heard say that who is second generation, who really kind of had that, that part of their life where they were still trying to navigate who they were. Are, are, am I an American woman? Am I, am I Muslim? Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, what do you think is the stigma on Muslim women maybe what people think is a Muslim woman compared to the reality of what it really means. Because I know that there's probably a lot of non Middle Eastern or non Muslim people that are listening who probably have this idea of what it is. You know, they think it's just all women wear hijabs and all women have to be fully covered. And we know that's not the case. So what's mm -hmm. your, your take on that? Yeah, I think a lot of that stems from uh, just a lack of education. Um, I It took me a, a while to understand why um, learning about Islam was so controversial or just like non-existent when it came to, you know, people who practice other faiths, specifically those in the Abrahamic faiths who are Christian and Jewish. Um, and it, it wasn't until I kind of like reassessed the way that I learned about Islam in my Islamic school classes. Um, and the order in which you learn things. So as a Muslim, in order to learn about your own religion, you first learn about Judaism, and then you learn about Christianity, and Islam is considered the third branch. And so I was kind of forced, in the best way, 
to learn about these other major faiths before learning about my own and being able to make that connection that, you know, they've all kind of stemmed from each other and um, to see the similarities in, in the belief systems. And nobody else really had the opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, if you speak to somebody from the Christian community, they can tell you surface level, the basics of Judaism. If you speak to somebody who is of the Jewish faith, if they've dabbled in, you know, religious history, they can tell you a little bit about each other um, faith. But for the most part, Judaism is where it stops because that's where their religion stopped. And so with Islam, you have to learn about all of it. And so there's this, you know, understand there's a greater understanding of how the Jewish community operates and how the Christian community operates. And there's a respect for, you know, um, the Muslim prophets are the same prophets that are in the Bible and the Torah. And so there, there's just this respect all around um, that Muslims have for, um, you know, these other major faiths. And it's just simply because of how we were taught our faith, how we had to learn it. And I think not having to do that has just given people this lack of understanding of, of Islam. Um, you know, I, one of my best friends, she's truly one of the smartest people that I know, a couple of years ago told me that, you know, she had gotten into an argument with her husband because somebody, I think she said, oh, you know, like, did you know Muslims believe in Jesus? And her husband was like, he's Jewish, she's Christian. And he was like, they absolutely do not. That's not true. And so she like told me about that and asked me, you know, oh, do you believe in Jesus? And I was like, yeah, of course. And I told her why. And uh, that, you know, he, his name, I think, is mentioned more times in the Quran than Prophet Muhammad. And so it was like that shock that made me want to kind of dive deeper into, OK, these are brilliant, brilliant people in my life. They don't know the very basics of what I believe in as a Muslim. Let me find out who else in my lifetime that I have known for decades upon decades doesn't know the the bare minimum of what it means to be Muslim. And so I did a poll um, between some of my friends that I've had for, you know, 25 plus years. Nobody knew the answers to the most basic questions <laughs> about what it, you know, what Muslims believe in. And so it just, it, the anger and like confusion as to why people hate Muslims or are afraid of Islam or um, have these, you know, stereotypes in their mind about what a Muslim woman is or what it means to be a Muslim, it all just kind of went away. And I, I kind of got this understanding and compassion for uh, people who just lack that education because, like I said, they weren't forced to learn it like we were when it came to religious classes or, um, you know, world history. And so I think when it comes to the stereotypes around being a Muslim woman, um, that's also something that has helped me, like, propel my career in this space of talking about identity and being Muslim, because like you said, everybody thinks a Muslim woman is somebody who's super dark brown skin, wears a hijab, doesn't speak, is not educated, doesn't have a job. Um, and I just kind of come in here and I blow the doors open and I'm like, what's up guys? Like I'm Muslim. Let me tell you about my right. life. I look white. <laughs> I look like you. So you're going to listen because I make you comfortable. Mm. Um, and I've like kind of used it to my advantage. Um, and so, and it's something that I'm sure, you know, you are able to do as an Arab Latina woman where people are just kind of a little bit confused on what you are. You could be Italian, you could be Greek, but there's like pieces of Nobody you, the knows. way you talk, <laughs> yeah, the way you're educated, the way you look, you, you make people comfortable and it, it gives them the opportunity to kind of drop those stereotypes, lay down the barriers and want to listen and be engaged with you because there are similarities. And, and while that's like a crappy reason for people to, to actually engage in these types of conversations, um, I think there's a lot of power in it for people who, you know, look like us, sound like us. Um, and I think it's important that we, you know, we use it to our advantage and we use it to bring good to the world and to break down those walls and to crush those stereotypes. Um, Cause yeah. we've been given, you know, we've been given this privilege and we should be using it. And I think there's a big difference between what people it's like, I always see those Instagram posts, Instagram versus reality. And I think mm -hmm. that really speaks to even the Arab community. Everyone just thinks that women don't have jobs or they're just supposed to stay at home and take care of the kids. They are covered from head to toe. They have no voice. All Arab men are abusive and controlling. And that's really just not the case. Now, I, I will say that there are some parts of my family and culture that I have seen that 
I don't always 100%, you know, agree with everything, right? But that's Mm -hmm. my belief system and just certain ways that I grew up, I grew up very differently. However, even just talking to my cousins who are second generation, and, you know, grew up in the US and even some of my aunts, it is very different when you see the generational differences. And I, I do see changes, I feel like, my generation, like a lot of my cousins who are full Palestinian and grew up in that culture, they're very feminist. They're very free. They are in relationships that they're in love, that they're marrying for love. Some do, some don't, you know, that's their choice, but mm-hmm. they have a choice with the things that they do. Um, there are traditional values that I see where it's very different for me and hard for me to relate because I'm so independent. I've been on my own for so long where I see my cousins that generally don't leave the house until they're getting married. But then you see a lot of Latina cultures that are the same way. And I think that's where the disconnect is, is people think like, oh, it's only, you know, Arab and Muslim cultures. Like, no, this is the norm in a lot of cultures. There's Mm -hmm. Mexican communities, you know, Colombian, Brazilian, there's a lot of people that don't leave the house until they're married. There's a lot of uh, communities and households that are strict Catholic or that have Mm -hmm. certain Christian beliefs. And when you take a step back and look at it as a whole, we're really not all that different. There's a lot of similarities, but like you mentioned, there just seems to be like a lack of education. So how did you get into this advocacy because I see your platform you're doing all this advocacy and you feel so strongly about education how did you get more involved in that and what really drove you to start doing the advocacy that you do when it comes to the Palestinian community yeah um that's a great question I've actually never thought of how I kind of I just I feel I always feel, say that I fell into this but it's not like obviously life events just kind of propel you into where you're supposed to be Um, And I think that that's exactly what happened here. Um, I spent a majority of my life hiding who I was, being told that if somebody finds out I'm Palestinian, it could put my family in harm, it could put my career in danger, Um, I would lose friends, all of which is not untrue. Um, So having gone through, you know, a decade of career changes, um, it definitely does impact, you know, your ability to grow within certain companies and uh, to be yourself among certain colleagues uh, when they find out what your identity is, especially when it's something as contentious as being Palestinian. Um, So, you know, immediately when somebody finds out that I am of Palestinian descent, they crack a joke about, oh, is it okay if we work together or if we're still friends because I'm Jewish? And I'm like... (laughs) I've had that too. You know, it's just never, yeah. And it's, it's so, and again, it all goes back to like lack of, of, of education. And so I I really think that education is the key to, like I said, breaking down those barriers and crushing those stereotypes. And especially when it comes to what the media, I'm, I myself am a media professional. And so I've experienced firsthand uh, the media bias around the Palestinian movement and our struggle and our history. And, um, having the ability and the platform and the connections to be able to speak my mind finally and to not have to worry, you know, I'm my own boss now, so I don't have to worry about being fired if, <laughs> if I say something yes. a little controversial. Love that. Um, yeah. But um, I, I think, you know, understanding the media bias when it comes to being Palestinian and, and being Muslim also, you know, um, our our story is very much intertwined always in American media and Western media with violence and despair and, you know, refugee status. Um, And so there's so much more to us that I felt cheated, not knowing because of how hard I tried to fit into American society, that I don't want that to happen for anybody else of Palestinian descent or any other type of, like I said, culture outside of the Western world. Um, And that I don't want non-Palestinians to have to experience as well. Like, I understand, I understand these stereotypes. I understand people's fears because it's all that they've seen. It's all that they're exposed to. And so having the platform and the ability to expose them to something different um, and to just humanize us. Like, if you look at my, you know, my Instagram page, I'm not even really that political in the grand scheme of how political I could be and other Palestinian advocates. Um, 
I don't use the word activist because I, I think it's such a powerful term and I, I don't deserve it. Um, but if you look at, you know, Palestinian activists, like real activists, um, they are like brutal in the best way. Like they don't sugarcoat anything. They give our history and our experience and our existence in the present day um, exactly how it is. They, they will, you know, they don't care about people's comfort. And I necessarily don't care about other people's comfort either, but I think I've taken more of a, this is my culture and this is how I appreciate it. And this is how I love who I am. Um, and I want you to love it too. I want you to learn what Tetris is. I want you to, to love the tobe, to be fascinated with the tobes that I was too embarrassed to wear when I was a teenager in my, you know, early twenties. Bring any American, um, and I, some Palestinian food and they'll fall yes. in love real quick. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like you all know what hummus is and falafel, but do you know where it comes from? Do you know, you know, the history behind this food? Do you know why we use, you know, vegetables like eggplant so much? Um, and so being able to kind of teach people from that perspective rather than going full force into the political angle. Um, has gotten them to sympathize with the Palestinian people and it's gotten them to understand us and to take an appreciation for us and our culture. And that in turn generates a new generation of pro-Palestine supporters that wouldn't have necessarily ever gotten there if they were only being exposed to what they see in mainstream Western media or what, you know, the brave um, activists are doing. Um, there, there needs to be kind of like that middle ground where people can feel comfortable asking questions and expressing themselves and, you know, being able to kind of unlearn some of the stereotypes that they've inherited either from their parents or from their education system. Um, and I love being that middle person. I love, you know, giving them a reason to look at something, you know, in Top Shop and like recognize it from my page and be like, oh, that's the kafia pattern. This is cultural appropriation. <laughs> now I understand what she's talking about. So um, it's giving people just these real life examples of what it's like to to be from our community, and I think it's it's been a really awesome experience. I love that. I love that, and I think that it's so important to expose people to different cultures and communities because I think a lot of and I'm not speaking for all Americans. I'm speaking just in general, you know, generalizing, but. Mm -hmm. I was in the military. I was in the Marine Corps. And when I was in the military, I was in during a time of Iraq and Afghanistan war. So wow. there was a lot of emphasis around this hatred for the Muslim community. And not everyone, but I think it was kind of like the norm that that's the enemy. And then it's like, well, I'm part Palestinian. So where do I fit in <clears throat> in all this? Because mm -hmm. I know that not everybody is bad. That's a select group of people that is. But I think because of the events that we had to endure during 9-11, it really put this false understanding on the Arab community and it's trickled throughout the years. And I think we're finally starting to get to a point where people are becoming a little bit more compassionate. You see this happening with the Palestine movement and so many people that are supporting it. And so for those that are listening that maybe don't really know a lot about Palestine or the history of Palestine, I felt I feel like maybe we should have started with this, but I think <laughs> it's really important for people to kind of be educated a little bit about the history and why is the Palestine movement so big right now and why now? Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with the why now, I guess, and work my way backwards. Um, the reason why you have heard about Palestine in the media now is because of social media. Um, like I said, there was a huge bias against uh, telling the truth about the Palestinian story and our history in mainstream media. And so we never got the spotlight. We never got the, the chance to share our stories. They were always twisted to fit an agenda. Um, that's usually, you know, pro-Israel journalists have come out and said that they've been censored over the last 20 years with the way that they report. And um, social media opened the doors to a new platform where it's uncensored. Well, depends on who you talk to. It's uncensored for the most part. Um, and it's given, you know, back in May of 2021, um, you had the brother and sister, Rio Una and Mohammed al Kurd, and they were live streaming what was happening to their home and their family. Um, and that, sent people into like shock. They could not believe what they were seeing. Mind you, 
as Palestinians, you're like, okay, this happens literally every day. This is what we've been trying to tell you people, mm-hmm. <laughs> but nobody will, you know, nobody will, will, will report the truth. And so it was the bravery of, you know, our Palestinian brothers and sisters actually in Palestine to be able to pick up their phone and, and live stream something and have the ability to connect with millions and millions of people right there on the spot. Um, it completely changed the landscape of how Palestine is being covered in the media today. Um, Cause like I said, after that happened, when people were like, how has this been happening for 73 years and nobody's heard about it? It, it gave us the opening and, and it gave these other journalists in mainstream media, the ability and, and the courage to speak up and say, well, actually we've been trying to report about it for the last 20, 30 years, but our companies have forced us to, tweak the stories or change the headlines. And um, so it, it started a whole conversation on, you know, the censorship of, of Palestine and Palestinians uh, over the last 70 plus years. And so I, I think the reason why people hear about it today, I think a lot of it has to do with um, the power of social media, which is very largely underrated and overlooked. Um, and so I think that has talking about our, existence and our reality today, both as Palestinians in Palestine and throughout the diaspora, has given us the opportunity to finally share our history and to finally share our grandparents' stories and our parents' stories. Um, And so, you know, I am, my grandfather is an original 1948 refugee. And for the first time ever, I've been able to share his story on my social media pages. And and I interviewed him just the other day, uh, like formally, like with my camera stand. And it was, you know, just him and and he was like, I want to tell this, 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 and that. And it was the first time, like his face just lit up. It was the first time mm. that he was able to tell these stories that even my mom and her siblings had never heard before because they were too painful for him to relive and to to relive and then to be gaslit about, mm. right? Like if he were to tell people outside of this time um, or if he were to tell the story to a journalist back then, um, it would have been twisted. And so I think a lot of these memories... And this history has been repressed by our grandparents for purely self-protection purposes. They don't want to be gaslit. They don't want to be told that their stories are not true. They don't want, you know, people who are listening to find an excuse or a reason as to why they deserve to become a refugee 70 years ago. Um, And so it was just really incredible to see how excited he was because he knows people are listening now. He knows that it's different. Um, and so I don't know, like to see that twinkle in the eye of an 86 year old man, I think it's really special. And um, I think it says a lot about our generation today and how much, you know, we're honoring our ancestors and, and how much work we've put into getting to this place today. I think that's really powerful and, and interesting, too, because when I talked to my grandfather and I didn't know him growing up and I didn't really reconnect with him until maybe about two or three years ago. And when I talked to him. It's funny because I'm like, you're funny. You're, he's cute and he's, I can be myself. And I didn't think I could be myself. And he's told me some of the stories and I, I'm just so fascinated with how he grew up, how that tradition was, how the culture was. There are definitely are some huge culture differences with any generation, mm-hmm. but I feel like I can actually be myself. And that's something that I didn't think I could be for the longest time. I didn't think I could be myself with that side of the family. Cause I'm like, they're not going to, they're going to judge me. They're not going to know me. They're not going to like me. And when I'm learning about some of the stories and I listen to my cousins, I hear their stories, how they grew up. I hear my grandfather's stories. It's, it's really intriguing to be able and honored to be able to hear the different ways that people grew up in their stories, their hardships, how they've overcome hardships, even overcame traumas, you know, even dealing with when they were children. So I really am incredibly thankful for people like you who have this platform to empower women, especially, um, and educate on the, the differences of what our mainstream media is showing compared to maybe what the reality is and the history of Palestine and what's going on. Because you're right, this has been going on for a very long time. And it's now social media that is making us aware of it. And people are on this human kindness movement and it's like holy shit this what how can you kill all these people or how can you do this and and the reality is if you talk to a lot of our parents and our grandparents this has been going on for many 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 years so to Mm -hmm. you when you think about a free palestine what does that look like for you 
Oh, that is obviously a free Palestine means being able to go back and visit um, and to move around freely throughout the country. And um, but really, I my grandfather has not, not been back since he became a refugee in 1948, um, and it is just a dream to be able to go with him and bring him back to his childhood home, which is still there where we know that, you know, um, settlers are living in it now. Um, but to just go there and um, be a part of the olive harvest. I don't know why that's like something that sticks out so much to me. Um, I guess that's why I named my company. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> but um, Olives are for some reason, a staple in my brain of Palestinian culture. Um, but so it's always just been a dream to like go with my family, move freely around the country and like be a part of the olive harvest, which is an ancient tradition for Palestinians. Um, and to see my grandfather's house and to see him back in it, um, whether that means actually getting it back or him just being able to visit and feel safe and to not feel like he's doing something wrong or mm. like something bad is going to happen because he returned back home. Um, that's we all just I think if you ask any Palestinian what they envision a free Palestine being, it's the right of return and, and just being able to be back home and to feel safe. That's really powerful. And so what would your biggest takeaway in terms of what you want people to know or understand? If you could, you know, say, hey, I just want people to understand A, B, and C, what would be the biggest takeaway that you want America to understand that you want people listening or anyone who just wants to understand Palestine culture and history? Um, I think the most important for me is people understand Palestinians as an indigenous group of people um, to the land of Palestine. Our connections there go back thousands and thousands of years. Our beauty traditions, our fashion traditions, our fashion staples, they are thousands and thousands of years old. Um, and so it's important to recognize uh, Palestinians as an indigenous community. And from there, it will help you understand what is happening to us a lot better. Uh, you'll be able to, you know, say words like apartheid without being uncomfortable or feeling like you're saying something that's dirty. You'll be able to see it as settler colonialism instead of, you know, what the media is trying to tell you it is. Um, and so I, I think understanding Palestinians as an indigenous people is the first step to actually learning about what's happening to us and what has happened to us over the last seven decades. Wow. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you for this whole conversation, because for me, this was super therapeutic. It was super educational because this is part of who I am and this is part of my ethnicity and it makes me proud. It really does. This conversation reminds me that I need to be proud, even though it's not I'm not 100% Palestinian, but it's still part of who I am. It's my history. And thank you for bringing that educational component back into my life, because I think that's part of what I'm missing. And it motivates me to do a little bit more research, to educate myself, maybe learn how to cook a meal, because I don't know how to cook a traditional Middle Eastern meal. <laughs> Send me some recipes, because yeah. I see so my one of my aunts. She's going to, I can guarantee you she's listening to this episode. <laughs> so she shout out because that, that woman can cook. I always see her, her Instagram posts and I'm just like, oh my God, man, that's one thing when I go back home, they live in Cleveland now, but when I go okay. back to Cleveland and I go visit, they can cook. I'm like, oh, you're here. We're just going to cook something really quick. And they throw a huge lamb on the table course spread yeah <laughs> with the rice yeah. and you know yeah. i'm like this this is something quick i i yeah. really want to see just what you casual just brunch. a casual brunch nothing i mean yeah. i if you go to any middle eastern household you are going to eat and if you don't eat enough or if you're skinny they're going to keep feeding you <laughs> yes and if you don't yes. make sure you eat because if you don't it's disrespectful <laughs> yes yeah it's offensive if you say no i remember being a kid and visiting and my mom's like you better eat you better eat and i was so picky <laughs> and i remember my my grandfather's wife and she i she's speaking arabic and i was like what is she saying they're like she's saying you're too skinny you need to eat <laughs> <laughs> and now as an adult, when I go there, I'm like, yes, give me the food. Give, give it to me. me. Yeah, so thank you so much for just, you know, being willing to share this vulnerable side and, and educating people. And please keep doing what you're doing. Um, 
I'm just so thankful that we have people like you who are just so um, forward with your platform and open and honest and create a safe space for other Palestinian women and men to connect with their culture. And, you know, even people who are listening who are non-Muslim or not Middle Eastern, I'm sure are going to get a lot of, out of this episode. So where can people follow you? Where's your platform? Because I really want people to be able to kind of keep up with what you're doing. Thank you. Well, it was an honor to be here and I'm grateful. I'm equally as grateful for this opportunity because seeing how energized you are and how excited you are to learn more about your culture is really what keeps me going. Um, so some days when I have a little bit of a lull and I'm like, I don't know, am I creative enough? Am I doing enough? Um, this is, I'm grateful for conversations like this because they really do make an impact on, um, you know, the next thing that I do. Um, and so with that said, all of my stuff is on Instagram. I think that's my main platform, um, which is my handle is at Janan Matari. Um, that's where I do, you know, some fun reels. They vary from relationship stuff to parenting stuff to, you know, Palestinian fashion and trends and beauty and food. And then some educational stuff. I throw it in there once, you know, like I said before, once I suck people in and I get them to listen, I'll throw the hard stuff at them I love it. when I know they won't run away. I love um, it. I love but it. So I, I think that's the, that's the best platform is, okay. is really Instagram. Well, I'm yeah. going to tag you on everything. So everyone knows thank where you. to find you. So um, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so humbled. Likewise. All right. Thank you so much. This was awesome. And to everyone who's listening or watching, if there's anyone who you think will resonate with the episode, share this. I think regardless if you're Middle Eastern, if you're Hispanic, if you're white, doesn't matter. I think share it. I think everyone can resonate at some level or at least be educated. So thank you so much. And until next time, see you on the next episode of Diary of an Empath. Mm -hmm.